even if you train a system to have a world model that can predict what's going to happen next, the world is really complicated and there's probably all kinds of uh, situations that the system hasn't been trained on and need to you know, fine tune itself as it goes. The question of, of how we organize AI research going forward, which is somewhat determined by how afraid people are of the consequences of AI. So if you have a rather positive view of the impact of AI on society and you trust humanity and society and democracies to use it in good ways, then the best way to make progress is to open research. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing. And of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash I on AI. That's E-Y-E-O-N-A-I all run together. Oracle.com slash I on AI. Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is I on AI. In this episode, I speak again with Yann LeCun, one of the founders of Deep Learning and someone who followers of AI should need no introduction to. Yan talks about his work on developing world models, on why he does not believe AI research poses a threat to humanity, and why he thinks open source AI models are the future. In the course of the conversation, we talk about a new model, Gaia One, developed by a company called Wave AI. I'll have an episode with Wave's founder to further explore that world model, which has produced some startling results. I hope you find the conversation with Jan as enlightening as I did. I mean, first, the, the notion of a world model is, is the idea that uh, a system would get some idea of the state of the world and be able to predict uh, sort of following states of, of the world resulting from just the natural evolution of the world or resulting from an action that the agent might take, right? So if you have an idea of the state of the world and you imagine an action that you're going to take the, you, and you can predict the resulting state of the world, uh, then that means you can predict what's going to happen as a consequence of a sequence of actions. And that means you can plan a sequence of actions to arrive at, at a particular goal. And that's really what a world model is. At least that that's what, uh, uh, the, the way people have understood the, the word in, in other contexts, like in the context of optimal control and robotics and things like that. Um, so that, that's what a world model is. Now, there are several levels of complexity of those world models, you know, whether they model yourself, you, uh, you know, the agent, uh, or whether they model the external world, which is much more complicated. Um, and then, um, the, so, so, Training a world model basically consists in just observing the world go by and then learning to predict what's going to happen next or observing the world, taking an action and then observing the resulting uh, effect. An action that you take as an agent or an, an action that you see other agents uh, taking, right? So that establishes uh, causality essentially with, you know, you could think of this as a causal model. So those models don't need to predict all the details about the world. They don't need to be generative. They don't need to predict exactly every pixels in a video, for example, because uh, what you need to be able to predict is enough details, you know, some sort of abstract representation to allow you to uh, uh, plan, right? So, um, you know, you're assembling a, I don't know, something out of wood and you're going to, uh, you know, put two planks together and uh, attach them with uh, screws, you know, it doesn't matter the details of like which type of uh, screwdriver you're using or 
the size of the screw within some limits and things like that. There are, there are details that in the end don't matter as to what the end result uh, will be or the precise grain of the, of the wood and, and, and things of that type. So, um, so you need to have some abstract level of representation within which you can make the prediction without having to predict every detail, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that's why those JPA architectures I've been advocating uh, are, are useful. So models like uh, uh, the, the Gaia one model from Wave actually makes prediction in an abstract representation space. There's been a lot of work in that area for years also at, at FAIR, but, but generally the abstract representation were pre-trained. So the encoders that would take images from videos and then encode them into some representation were trained in some other way. And the progress we've made over the last uh, six months in uh, self-supervised learning for images and video is that now we can train the entire system to make those predictions um, uh, simultaneously. So we, we have systems now that can uh, learn good representations of images. Uh, and the basic idea is, is very simple. You take, a, you take an image, uh, you run it through an encoder, then you corrupt that image, uh, you mask parts of it, for example, or you transform it in various ways, you uh, blur it, you change the colors, you change the framing a little bit, and you run that corrupted image through the same encoder or something very similar. And then you train the encoder to predict the features of the complete image from the features of the, of the uh, uh, corrupted one. Um, you're not trying to reconstruct the perfect image. You're, yeah. you're just trying to predict the representation of it. Okay. Um, and this is different. This is not generative in the sense that it does not produce pixels. And that's the secret to getting self-supervised learning to work in the context of images and video. You don't want to be predicting pixels. It doesn't work. You can predict pixel as an afterthought, which is what the Gaia system is doing by sticking a decoder on it and with some diffusion right. model that will produce a nice image. But that's kind of a, a second step. Yeah. The, if you train the system by predicting pixels, uh, you just don't get good representations. You don't get good predictions. You get blurry predictions most of the time. Um, so that that's what makes learning from images and video fundamentally different from learning from text. Because in text, you don't have that problem. It's easy to predict words, yeah. uh, even if you can do you cannot do a perfect prediction, because because language is discrete. So language is simple compared to the real world. Yeah. And and you know there's a lot written right now about the the uh, the energy required and the computational resources uh, GPUs required uh, to train language models. Is it less in training a world model like uh, using IJEPA architecture? Well, it's hard to tell because there is no equivalent uh, training procedure. Uh, self-supervised training procedure for video, for example, that does not use JPA. Uh, the ones that are generative don't really work. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, but but uh, this architecture could also be applied to language, couldn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you could uh, very well uh, use a, a JPA architecture that makes prediction in representation space uh, and apply it to language. Yeah. Definitely. And in that case, would it be less computationally uh, intense uh, than than training a large language model? It's possible. Uh, it's not entirely clear either. Um, I mean, there is some advantage, regardless of what technique you're using, to making those models really big. Um, they they just seem to work better if uh, if you make them big. So. Um, if you make them bigger, right? So scaling is useful. Uh, Contrary to uh, some claims, I do not believe that scaling is sufficient. So in other words, we're not going to get anywhere close to human level AI. Uh, in fact, not even animal human uh, animal level AI uh, by simply scaling up uh, language models, um, even multimodal language models that we apply to video. We're going to have to find new concepts, new architectures. And I've, I've, I've written sort of a vision paper about this. Uh, a while back, uh, of you know a sort of different type of uh, architecture that that would be uh, uh, necessary for this. So scaling is necessary but not sufficient, um, and we we're missing some basic ingredients to get to um, uh, 
human level AI. Um, we are fooled by the fact that LLMs are fluent. And so we yep. think that they have human level intelligence because they can manipulate language, but that's false. Um, and in fact, um, there's a very good uh, uh, symptom for this, which is that we have systems that can pass the bar exam, uh, but you know, answering answering questions from text by basically regurgitating what they've learned, uh, more or less by rote. Uh, but we don't we don't have completely autonomous level five self driving cars, uh, or at least no system that can learn to do this in about twenty hours of practice, just like any seventeen year old. Yeah, um, and we certainly don't have any domestic robot that can clear up the dinner table and fill up the dishwasher, a task that any 10 year old can learn in one shot. So, yeah. uh, so clearly we're missing something big and, and that something is an ability to learn uh, how the world works and the world is much more complicated than language. And also being able to plan and reason, um, basically having a mental world model of what goes on that allows to plan and predict uh, consequences of actions. Uh, that's, that's what we're missing. Yeah. It's going to take a while before we figure this out. You you were uh, on another paper that talked about uh, augmented uh, language models, and um, in the embodied Turing test was that the same paper? The embodied Turing test. Uh, can, can you talk about that? About uh, first of all, what is the embodied Turing test? I didn't I didn't quite understand that. Well. Uh... Okay, it's 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 a different it's a different concept, but it, it's basically the idea that you uh, it's based on the on the the Moravec paradox, right? So Moravec many years ago uh, noticed that things that appeared difficult for humans turned out to sometimes be very easy for computers to to do, like playing chess, um, much better than humans, or I don't know, computing integrals or whatever. Certainly, doing arithmetics. Um, yeah. But then there are things that we take for granted as humans that we don't even consider them intelligent tasks that we are incapable of reproducing with computers. And so that's where the embodied Turing test comes in. Like, you know, observe what a cat can do or, or how fast a cat can learn uh, new, new, new tricks or, or, you know, how a cat can plan to jump on, you know, a bunch of different furniture to get to the top of uh, wherever it wants to go. Uh, that's an amazing feat that we can't reproduce with robots today. Um, so uh, that that's kind of the embodied Turing test, if you want. Like, you know, can you have make a robot that can behave, have behaviors that are indistinguishable from those of animals, first of all, and and can acquire new ones uh, at the same with the same efficiency as uh, as, as animals. Um, then the augmented LLM paper is different. It's about uh, uh, how do you sort of minimally change large language models so that they can use tools so they can, uh, to some extent, plan actions? Like, you know, you need to compute the product of two numbers, right? You just call a calculator and you know you're going to get the product of those two numbers. Right. And LLMs are notoriously bad for arithmetic, so they need to do this kind of stuff. Or or do a, a search, you know, using a search engine or database lookup or something like this. So there's a lot of work on this right now, and it's somewhat incremental, like, you know, how can you sort of minimally change LLM and take advantage of their current capabilities, but still augment them with uh, the ability to use tools? Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't want to get into the, the too much into the threat debate, um, but, you know, you're, you're on one side, your colleagues, uh, Jeff and Yashur on the other. I recently saw a picture of the three of you. I think you put that up on... Uh, social media right. uh, uh, saying how, you know, you can disagree, but still be friends uh, this idea of augmenting language models uh, with uh, stronger reasoning capabilities and the ability and the agency, the ability to use tools is precisely what Jeff and Yashua are worried about. Uh, it, can, can you just get, why are you not worried about that? Okay. Um, uh, so first, f first of all, this is not necessarily what you're describing is not necessarily what they are afraid of. Um, mm -hmm. They 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 are alerting uh, 
people and various governments and others about various dangers that they perceive. Okay, so when danger, uh, when set of danger are relatively short term, there are things like, you know, bad people will use technology for bad things. What can bad people use powerful AI systems for? And one concern that, you know, governments have been worried about and uh, uh, intelligence agencies and counter uh, intelligence and stuff like that is, you know, could badly intentioned uh, organizations or, or countries use LLM to help them, I don't know, design pathogens or chemical weapons or, or, or other things or, or cyber attacks, you know, things like that, right? Now, those problems are not new. Those problems have been with us for a long time. And the question is, what incremental help would AI systems uh, bring to the table? So my opinion is that as of today, AI systems are not sophisticated enough to provide any significant help uh, for such badly intentioned people because those systems are trained with public data that is publicly available on the internet, and they can't really invent anything. They're going to regurgitate with a little bit of um, interpolation, if you want, but um, they cannot produce anything that you can't get from a search engine in a in a few minutes. Um, so that actually that claim is being tested at the moment. There are people who are actually kind of trying to figure out, like, is it the case that you can uh, actually do something? You're enabled to do something more dangerous with sort of current AI technology that you you can't do with a search engine. Um, results are not out yet. But my, uh, my hunch is that, you know, it's not going to enable a lot of people to, to do significantly uh, bad things. Um, then there is the issue of things like code generation for cyber, cyber attacks and things like this. And those problems have been with us for years. And the interesting thing that most people should know, like, you know, uh, also for like disinformation or attempts to corrupt the electoral process and things like this. And what's very important for everyone to know is that the best countermeasures that we have against all of those attacks currently use AI massively, okay? So AI is used as a defense mechanism against those attacks. It's not actually used to do the attacks yet. Um, and so now it becomes the question of, you know, who has the better system? Like are the countermeasures, uh, is the AI used by, counter, by the countermeasures be significantly better than the AI is used by the attackers? so that you know the the problem is uh, uh, satisfactorily mitigated and that's 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 where we are now the good news is that there are many more good guys and bad guys there are many they are usually much more competent they're usually much more sophisticated they're usually much more better funded uh, and they they have a strong incentive to take down the attackers so um it's a game of cat and mouse just like every yeah Every security that's ever existed, um, there's nothing new there. Okay, no, nothing qualitatively new. Yeah, um, but but uh, this also, okay. But then there is the question of uh, existential risk, right? And and this is something that both uh, Jeff and Joshua have been uh, thinking of fairly recently. So for for Jeff, it's only sort of just before last summer that he became uh, he started thinking about this because before he thought. He was convinced that the kind of algorithms that we had were significantly inferior to the kind of learning algorithm that the brain used. And the epiphany he had was that, in fact, no, because looking at the capabilities of uh, large language models that can do pretty amazing things with a relatively small number of neurons and synapses, he said, maybe they're more efficient than the brain and maybe the learning algorithm that we use back propagation is actually better than whatever it is that the brain uses. So we started thinking about like, you know, what are the consequences? And, it, but that's very recent. And in my opinion, he hasn't thought about this enough. Um, uh, Yoshua went to a similar epiphany uh, last winter where he started thinking about the long-term consequences um, and, and, and came to the, the conclusion also that there was a potential danger. He, he, they're both convinced that AI has enormous potential benefits. They're just worried uh, about the dentures, and they're both worried about the dentures because they have some doubts about the ability of our institutions to do the best with technology. Uh, you know, whether they are political, economic, geo you know, geopolitical, uh, financial institutions, 
or, or industrial to do the right thing, to be motivated by the right, uh, uh, the right thing. So, um, you know, the, if, if you trust the system, if you trust uh, uh, humanity and democracy, um, you, you, you might be entitled to believe that society is going to make the best use of uh, future technology. If you don't believe in the uh, solidity of those institutions, then you might be scared. Okay. I think I'm more confident in humanity and democracy than they are. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, whatever current systems that they are, I've been thinking about this problem for much longer, actually, um, since at least 2014. So when I, when I started, uh, fair at, at Facebook at the mm -hmm. time, it became pretty clear, pretty early on that, you know, deploying AI systems was going to have. Uh, uh, big consequences on people and society. And we got confronted to this very early. And so I started thinking about those problems very early on. Um, things like, you know, countermeasures against uh, like bias um, in AI systems, systematic bias, uh, countermeasures against uh, attacks um, uh, or, hate, you know, detection of hate speech in every language, things like that. These are, th these are things that people at FAIR worked on and then were eventually deployed. Uh, to just to give you an example, the uh, proportion of hate speech that was taken down automatically by AI systems five years ago, no, in 2017, uh, was about 20 to 25 percent. Last year, it was 95 percent. Hmm. And the difference is entirely due to progress in uh, natural language understanding, entirely grew to transformers that are pre-trained, self-supervised, and can essentially detect hate speech in any language. Not perfectly. Nothing is perfect. Is ever perfect. Yeah. But AI is used massively there, and that's the solution. So I started thinking about those issues, including existential risk, very early on. In fact, in 2015, uh, early 2016, actually, I organized uh, a, a conference hosted at NYU on the future of AI, where a lot of those questions were, were discussed. I invited people like uh, Nick Bockstrom and uh, uh, you know, Eric Schmidt and uh, Mark Schreffer, who was the CTO of Facebook at the time, uh, Demis Sabis, you know, a lot of people, um, both from the academic and AI research side and from the industry side. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were two days, a public day and kind of a more private day. What came out of this is the creation of an institution called the Partnership on AI. So this is a discussion I had with Demis Sabis, which was, you know, it, would, there be, would it be useful to have a forum where we can discuss um, before they happen sort of bad things that could happen as a consequence of deploying AI? Pretty soon, we brought on board uh, Eric Corvitz um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and a bunch of other people. And we co-founded this thing called the Partnership on AI, which basically has been uh, funding um, studies about AI ethics and uh, consequences of, uh, of AI and uh, publishing guidelines about you know, how you do it right to, to minimize harm. So this is not a new thing for me. Like I've been thinking about this for 10 years, essentially. Yeah. Uh, whereas for Yosha and Jeff, it's much more recent. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, but nonetheless, this augmented AI or augmented language models that have stronger reasoning and, and agency raises the threat, uh, regardless of whether or not it can be countered uh, to a higher level. Right. Okay. So uh, I guess the question there becomes, what is the blueprint of future AI systems that will be capable of reasoning and planning, will understand how the world works, uh, will be able to, you know, use tools and have agency and things like that, right? Um, and I tell you, they will not be autoregressive LLMs. So the problems that we see at the moment of autoregressive LLM, the fact that they hallucinate, uh, they sometimes they say really stupid things. They don't really have a good understanding of the world. Uh, people claim that they have some simple world model, but it's very implicit and it's really not not good at all. Like for example, you, you know, you can tell an LLM that uh, A is the same as B, and then you ask if B is the same as A, and it will say I don't know or or no, right? So, I mean, the, those things don't really understand logic or anything like yeah. that, right? So. Um, uh, so, so we're uh, the, the the type of system that we're talking about that might be that might approach animal level intelligence and let alone human level intelligence have not been designed. They don't exist, 
And so discussing their danger and their, their potential harm is a bit like, you know, discussing the sex of angels at the moment, or to be uh, a little more um, accurate, perhaps. It would be kind of like discussing how we're going to make transatlantic flight at near the speed of sound safe when we haven't yet invented the turbojet yeah. in 1925. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, we can speculate, but you know, how, how do we, how did we make turbojet safe? It required decades of really careful engineering to make them incredibly reliable. And, uh, you know, now we can, you know, run like halfway around the world with a two engine, uh, 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 turbojet aircraft. Um, I mean, that's an incredible feat. Uh, and it's not like people were discussing sort of philosophical questions about how you make turbojet safe. It's just really careful and complicated engineering that no, no one, none of us would understand. Um, uh, so, you know, how, how can we ask, um, the AI community now to explain how AI systems are going to be safe? We haven't invented them yet. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That said, I have some idea <laughs> about yeah. how we can design them, uh, so that they have these capabilities and, and as a consequence, how they will be safe. I call this objective driven AI. So what that means is, um, essentially, uh, systems that produce their answer by planning their answer so as to satisfy an objective or a set of objectives. So this is very different from current LLMs. Current LLMs just produce one word after the other or one token, which is which are subword units. It doesn't matter, right? They don't really think and plan ahead, as we as we said before. They just produce one word after the other. That's not controllable. The only thing we can do is see if what they've produced, like check if what they've produced uh, satisfies some criterion uh, or a set of criteria, and then not produce an answer, produce a non-answer if the uh, answer that was that was produced is is inappropriate. But we can't really force them to uh, produce an answer that satisfies a set of uh, objectives. So objective-driven AI is the other way is is the opposite. the The only thing that the system can produce are answers that satisfy a certain number of objectives. So one objective would be, did you answer the question? Another objective could be, is your answer understandable by a 13 year old because you're talking to a 13 year old? Mm -hmm. Another would be, uh, is, it, is this, uh, I don't know, terrorist propaganda or something? Uh, you know, you can have a, a number of, of criteria like this guardrails that would guarantee that the answer that's produced is uh, satisfy certain criteria, whatever they are, okay? Same for a robot. You can guarantee that the sequence of actions that is produced will not hurt anyone. Like you can have very low level, you know, guardrails of this type that say, um, okay, you have, you know, humans nearby and you're cooking. So you have a big knife in your hand. Don't flare your arms. <laughs> okay. That, that would be a very simple guardrails to, to impose. And you can imagine having a whole bunch of guardrails like this that will guarantee that the behavior of those systems uh, will be safe and that, um, their primary goal would be to be basically subservient to us, right? So yeah. I, I do not believe that we'll have uh, AI systems that can work that uh, will not be subservient to us, will define their own goals, they will define their own sub goals, but those sub goals would be sub goals of goals that we set them um, and uh, will not have all kinds of guardrails that will guarantee the safety. And we're not going to, it's not like we're going to invent a system and make a gigantic one that we know will have human level AI and just turn it on. And then from the next, the next minute is going to take over the world. That's completely preposterous. What yeah. we're going to do is try with small ones, you know, maybe as smart as a mouse or something, maybe a dog, maybe a, maybe a cat, maybe a dog, maybe, and work our way up and then, you know, put some more guardrails. Basically, like we've engineered, you know, more and more powerful and more reliable turbojets. It's an engineering problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you were also on a paper, maybe this is the one that talked about, uh, the embodied Turing test on neuro AI. Um, it, can you explain what, what, what the neuro AI is? Okay. Uh, well, it's the idea that we should get some inspiration from neuroscience to build, uh, AI systems. And that there is something to be learned from, from neuroscience and from 
cognitive science to um, mm -hmm. to drive the design of AI systems, some inspiration. Okay, something to be learned, as well as the other way around. So what's interesting right now is that the best models that we have of how, for example, the visual cortex uh, works is uh, convolutional neural networks, which are also the models that we use to recognize images uh, primarily in uh, artificial systems. Uh, so there is kind of uh, information kind of being exchanged both ways. Yeah. There's, there's one, uh, you know, one way to make progress in AI is to kind of ignore nature and, and just, you know, kind of uh, try to solve problems in a sort of engineering fashion, if you want. Uh, I found interaction with neuroscience always uh, thought provoking. So you don't want to be copying nature very too closely because there are details in nature that are irrelevant. Uh, and there are principles on which, uh, you know, natural intelligence is based that we haven't discovered. So, um, but, but there is some inspiration to have certainly in your uh, convolutional net for inspired by the architecture of the visual cortex. Uh, the whole idea of neural net and deep learning came out of the idea that you know intelligence can emerge from a large collection of simple elements that are connected with each other and change the nature of their interactions. That's the whole idea, right? Um, so, um, so inspiration from neuroscience certainly has been extremely beneficial so far. And the idea of neuroAI is that you should keep going. You don't want to go too far. So, uh, going too far, for example, is trying to reproduce the. Uh, some aspect of the functioning of neurons with electronics. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Um, I'm skeptical about this, for example. So uh, your research uh, right now, are you, your main focus is on uh, furthering the, the JEPA architecture into other modalities or, or where, where are you headed? Uh, yeah, so I mean, the, the long-term goal is, uh, you know, to get machines to be as intelligent and learn as efficiently as animals and humans. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is that we need this because we need to amplify human intelligence. And mm -hmm. so intelligence is the most needed community commodity yeah. that you want in the world. Right. And so, uh, we could, um, you know, possibly bring a new renaissance to humanity if we could amplify uh, human intelligence using, using machines, which we are doing already with computers. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. That's pretty much what they've been designed to do. But, uh, but even more, you know, imagine a future where every one of us um, has a intelligent assistant uh, with us at all times. They can be smarter than us. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't feel threatened by that. We should feel like we are like a, you know a director of a big lab or a CEO of a, a company that has a staff working for them of people who are smarter than themselves. I mean, we're used to this already. I'm used to this, certainly working yeah. with people who are smarter than me. So uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't feel threatened by this, but it's, it's going to empower a lot of us, right? For, uh, uh, and humanity as a whole. Um, so I think that's, that's a good thing. That's, that's the overall practical goal, if you want, right? Then there's a scientific question that's behind this, which is really what, what is intelligence and how you build it? Uh, and then which is, you know, how can system learn? Uh, the way animals and humans seem to be learning so efficiently. And, and the next thing is, how do we learn how the world works? By observation, by watching the world go by uh, through vision and all the other senses. Um, and animals can do this without language, right? So it has nothing to do with language. It has to do with uh, learning from sensory uh, percepts. And learning mostly without acting, because any action you take can kill you. So it's better to be able to learn as much as you can without actually acting at all, just observing, mm -hmm. which is what babies do in the first few months of life. They can't hardly do anything, right? So they mostly right. observe and learn how the world works by observation. Uh, so what kind of learning takes place there? Um, so that's obviously kind of self-supervised, right? It's learning by prediction. That's an old idea from uh, cognitive science. Uh, and, and the thing is, you know, we can learn to predict videos, but then we notice that predicting videos, predicting pixels in a video is so finishly complicated that it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so then came this idea of JEPA, right? Learn representations so that you can make predictions in representation space. And that turned out to work really well for learning uh, image features. And now we're working on getting this to work for, for video. And eventually 
we'll be able to use this to learn, to learn word models where you show a piece of video and then you say, I'm going to take this action, predict what's going to happen next in the world. Um, and, you know, um, which is a bit what the Gaia system from Wave is, is doing at a, at a high level, but we need this at sort of various levels of abstraction so that we can build, uh, you know, systems that are more general than autonomous driving. Okay. That's the, yeah. The and, and, and is, and, and I, 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 it's my fault, so I won't go over the hour, but, um, is is it conceivable that someday there will be uh, a, a a model that you you maybe embodied in a robot that uh, is ingesting uh, video from uh, its environment and learning as it uh, and, and just continuously learning and getting smarter and smarter and smarter? Yeah, I mean that's kind of a bit of a necessity. Uh... The, the the reason being that you know even if you train a system to have a world model that can predict what's going to happen next, uh, the world is really complicated and there's probably all kinds of uh, situations that you you know you, the system hasn't been trained on and need to you know fine tune itself as it goes. Um, uh, so you know animals and, and humans do this uh, early in life by by uh, uh, by playing. So play is a way of learning your, your world model in situations that basically won't hurt you. Um, no. And, uh, uh, but then during life, of course, you know, when we, we learn to drive, there's all kinds of things, mistakes that we do initially that uh, we don't do after, after having some experience. And that's because we're fine tuning uh, our world model to some extent. Yeah. Uh, we're learning a new task. We're basically just learning a new, a new version of our world model. Right. So, um, so yeah, I mean, this type of continuous, uh, continual learning is, is going to have to, to be present, but the overall power and intelligence of the system would be limited by, you know, how much, like how big of neural net it's using and, uh, and various other constraints, you know, computational constraints, basically. You know, you're still young and, and this, um, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Well, well you, you're, you're younger than Jeff. Let me put it that way. I'm younger than Jeff. I'm older than Joshua. Uh, yeah, uh, but this uh, the progress you've made on world models is is fairly rapid from my point of view. Watching it, uh, are you uh, are you hopeful that uh, within your career you'll have uh, embodied robots that are are building world models through their interaction? in reality and and then being able to well i guess the other question on world models do you then combine it with a language model uh to to do reasoning uh or or is the world model able to to do reasoning on its own but are you hopeful that in your career you'll you'll get to the point where you'll have this continuous learning in a, in a world model yeah i sure hope so uh i might have another you know 10, 10 useful years or something like this in research uh, before my uh, brain, you know, turns into bechamel sauce, but, um, or something like that, you know, 15, 15 years if I'm lucky. Uh, so, uh, or perhaps less, but yeah, I, I hope that there's going to be uh, breakthroughs in that direction during that time. Now, whether that will uh, result in the kind of uh, artifact that you're describing, you know, robots that can, like you know, domestic robots, for example, or or self-driving cars that are they can learn fairly quickly by themselves. Um, I don't know because there might be all kinds of obstacles that we have not uh, envisaged that may appear on the way. You no, know, that's it's a constant in the history of AI that you have some new idea and a breakthrough, and you think that's going to solve all the world's problems, and then you kind of hit. Uh, limitation and you have to go beyond that limitation. So it's like, you know, you're climbing a mountain, you, you find a way to climb the mountain that you're seeing. And you know that once you get to the top, you will have the problem solved because now it's, you know, a gentle slope down. And once you get to the top, you realize that there is another mountain behind it that you hadn't seen. Yeah. Uh, so that that's that's been the history of AI, right? Where people have come up with sort of 
uh, new concepts, new ideas, new way to approach uh, uh, AI reasoning, whatever uh, perception, and then realize that their idea basically was very limited. Um, and so, um, so it, it, you know, this inevitably uh, we, we're we're trying to figure out like what's the next uh, revolution in AI. That, that's what I'm trying to figure out. And so, you know, learning how the world works from video. Having systems that have world model that allow systems to reason and plan. Um, and there's something I want to be very clear about, uh, which is an answer to your, to your question, uh, which is that you can have systems that reason and plan without manipulating language. Animals are capable of amazing feats of planning and also to some extent reasoning. Yeah. Um, they don't have language, at least most of them don't. Um, and so many of them don't have culture um, uh, because they are mostly solitary animals. So, um, you know, it's only the animals that have um, some level of culture. So, um, so the idea that a system can plan and reason is not connected with the idea that you can manipulate language. It's, those are two different things. It needs to be able to manipulate abstract notions. But those notions yeah. do not necessarily correspond to linguistic entities like words or things like that. Uh, we can have mental images, if you want, of things. Like you do uh, ask a physicist or a mathematician, you know, how they reason. It's very much in terms of sort of mental models that have nothing to do with language. Then you can turn things into, into language, but that's a different story. But it's a second, uh, a second step. Um, so, um, uh, so the, you know, we're going to have to figure out how to do this reasoning, hierarchical planning uh, in, in machines reproduce this first. And then, of course, you know, sticking language on top of it will help. Like it will make those systems smarter and be able, you know, it will allow us to communicate with them and teach them things. And they're going to be able to teach us things and stuff like that. But, uh, but those, this is a different question, really. The question of, of how we organize AI research going forward, which is somewhat determined by how afraid people are of the consequences of AI. So if you have a rather uh, positive view of the impact of AI on society and you trust humanity and society and democracies to use it in good ways, then the best way to make progress is to open research. Um, and, and, there are, and for the people who are afraid of the consequences, whether, whether they are societal or geopolitical, um, they're putting pressure on uh, governments around the world to regulate AI in ways that basically limit uh, uh, access, uh, particularly of open source code and things like that. And, and uh, it's a big debate at the moment. I'm very much on the side. So is Meta very much on the side yep. of open oh. research. Yeah, um, actually, that that was something I was going to ask you. Uh, and now that you brought it up, uh, because there, I've been talking to people about this. And there is a view that uh, aside from the risks of open source, you know, uh, again, uh, Jeff Hinton saying, uh, you know, would you open source thermonuclear weapons? Uh, aside from that is the, the question of as, as to whether open source can marshal the resources uh, to, to compete with proprietary models. And uh, b because of the tremendous resources required for when you're scaling these models uh, and and there's a question as to whether or not Meta will continue to open source future versions of Llama or, or not, not continue to open source, but whether it'll continue to invest uh, the resources needed to, to push uh, the open source models. Uh, so what do you think about that? Okay, there's a lot to say about this. Okay, so first thing is, uh, there's no question that Meta will continue to invest the resources to build uh, better and better AI systems because it needs it for its own products. So um, the resources will be invested. Now the next question is, uh, do you, you know, will we continue to open source the base models? And the answer is, uh, you know, probably yes, because that creates an ecosystem on top of which an entire industry can be built. And there is no point, you know, having 50 different companies. Uh, uh, building proprietary closed systems when you can have, you know, one good base open source base model that everybody can use. 
um, it's wasteful and it's not a good idea. And well, another reason for having open source models is that it, it, nobody has no entity as powerful as it thinks it is as a monopoly on good ideas. And so if you want people who can have good new innovative ideas to contribute, you need an open source platform. If you want the academic world to contribute, you need open source platforms. If you want the startup world to be able to build customized products, you need open source based models because they don't have the resources to, to build, right. to train uh, large models, right? Okay, and then there is the history that shows that for, for foundational technology, for uh, infrastructure type technology, open source always wins. Um, Right, it's true of the uh, software infrastructure of the internet. In the early 90s and mid 90s, there was a big battle between Sun Microsystems and Microsoft to produce the, deliver the uh, software infrastructure of the internet, you know, operating systems, uh, web servers, uh, web browsers, and, and, you know, various server side and client side frameworks, right? They both lost. Nobody yeah. is talking about them anymore. Um, the entire world is, uh, of of the web is using Linux and Apache and uh, yep. MySQL and uh, JavaScript and and you know and even the the, the basic uh, core code for for web browser is open source. Uh, so um, open source won by a huge margin. Why? Because it's uh, safer, gathers more people to contribute. All the features are unnecessary. It's more reliable. Um, uh, vulnerabilities are fixed faster, um, and uh, and it's customizable. So anybody can customize Linux to run on whatever hardware they want, right? Uh, so open source wins. But Everything. but, and but same you, same for AI. It's going to be the same thing. It's inevitable. The the people now who are climbing up, like OpenAI, their their system is based on publications from all of us. Yeah, sure. And from uh, open platforms like like PyTorch, yeah. ChatGPT is built using PyTorch. PyTorch was produced originally by Meta. Now it's owned by the Linux Foundation. It's open source. Yeah. They've contributed to it, by the way. Um, you know, their LLM is uh, based on transformer architectures invented at Google. Yeah. Um, all the tricks to kind of train all those things came out of like various papers um, from all kinds of different institutions, including uh, academia. All the fine tuning techniques. Same. So nobody works in a vacuum. The thing is, nobody can keep their advance and their advantage uh, for very long if they are secretive. Yeah, ex except that w with these models, because they're so compute intensive and they cost so much money to train, you need somebody like Meta that who's who's yep. going to be willing to build them and open source them. That's and right. that's why I was I, when I was asking whether they'll continue. Uh, it, um, obviously, Meta will continue building, uh, you know, resource-intensive models. But uh, the the question is whether they'll continue to open source them. I and if I'm if, telling you, I'm telling you, the only reason why Meta could stop uh, open sourcing models are legal. So if there is a law that outlaws. Uh, open source AI systems above a certain level of uh, sophistication, then of course we can do it. Uh, if there are laws that uh, in the US or across the world uh, makes it illegal to use public content to train uh, uh, AI systems, then it's the end of AI for everybody, not sure. just for the open yeah. source. Okay, yeah. so. Um, or, or at least the end of the type of AI that we are talking about today. We might have, you know, new AI in the future, but that don't require as much data. Uh, so the and then there is, you know, liability. If you uh, if if you if you if you believe in the kind of uh, that someone doing something bad with uh, an AI system that was open sourced by um, by Meta, then Meta is liable. Then Meta will have a big sure. incentive not to release it, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the entire question about this is around legal reasons and political decisions. But on the idea of uh, open source winning, don't you need more people or more companies like Meta building the foundation models uh, and open sourcing them? Or could it be 
could an open source ecosystem win based on a single company building the models? No, I mean, you need two or three. Um, and there are two or three, right? I mean, there is uh, there's Hugging Face. There is Mistral in France, who is uh, also embracing sort of an open source LLM. They have a very good LLM. It's a small one, but it's very good. Um, uh, there is, uh, you know, academic efforts like Lion. Um, uh, they don't have all the resources they need, but they, you know, they collect the data that is used by everyone. So everybody can contribute. Uh, one thing that I think is really important to understand also is that uh, there is a future in which uh, I described earlier, in which every one of us, every one of our interactions with the digital world will be mediated by an AI assistant. And this is going to be for, true for everyone around the world, right? Everyone who has any kind of uh, smart device. No. Eventually, it's going to be in our you know, augmented reality glasses, but you know, for the time being, in our smartphones, right? Yeah. Um, and so imagine that future where um, you, know, you are, I don't know, from uh, Indonesia or uh, Senegal or France, and your entire digital diet is done through the mediation of an AI system your government is not going to be happy about it. Your government <laughs> is going to want the local culture to be present in that system. It doesn't want that system to be closed sourced and controlled by a company on the West Coast of the US. Yeah. Okay. So just for reasons of uh, preserving the diversity of culture uh, across the world and not having or entire information diet being biased by whatever it is that some company on the West Coast of the U.S. thinks, uh, there's going to need to be open source platforms. And they're, go they're going to be predominant in, at least outside the U.S., for that reason, yeah. including yeah. China, right? There is all those talks about, oh, what if China puts their hand on our open source code? I mean, China wants control over its own LLM because they don't want their citizen to... Uh, you know, have access to uh, certain type of information. So they, they're not going to use our LLMs. They're going to train theirs that they already have. Yeah. yeah. And nobody is, you know, particularly ahead of anybody else by more than about a year. Yeah. And, and uh, China is pushing open source. I mean, they're very pro open source within their ecosystems. So. Some of them, you know, it's, uh, there's no like unified um, opinion there, but um uh, I mean, it's the same in in the West, right? There are some some governments that are too afraid of the risk, yeah. Um, and then, or or are thinking about it, and some others that are all for open source because they see this as the only way uh, for them to have any uh, influence on the uh, inform the type of information and culture that would be uh, mediated by those systems. Yeah. So it's it's going to have to be like Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia. Uh, you know, is 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 built by millions of people who contribute who are from all around the world in all kinds of languages. Okay, and it has a system for sort of vetting the information. The way AI systems of the future will be taught and will be fine-tuned will have to be the same way, will have to be crowdsourced. Um, because something that matters to uh, a, a farmer in southern India um, is probably not going to be taken into account by uh, the fine tuning done by uh, you know some uh, some company on the west coast of the US AI might be the most important new computer technology ever it's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested so buckle up the problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control it's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, 
Take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash I on AI. That's E-Y-E-O-N-A-I all run together. Oracle.com slash I on AI. That's it for this episode. I want to thank Jan for his time. If you want to read a transcript of this conversation, you can find one on our website, ionai, that's E-Y-E hyphen O-N dot A-I. And remember, the singularity may not be near, but A-I is changing your world, so best pay attention. 